So we can get started whenever you want. I've got 701, so um, ask away anything you want. And if you don't have any, uh, silence is OK, too. Sarah's TA is going to be here. Nope. He's got surgery or something. Yeah. Like right now. Yeah. Yeah, in the back, what? Sure. Um, you know, um, I'll tell you, I won't test you on it, but I will describe it. Okay, so the idea is, let's suppose you have an event occurs here, and you've got a, an idea about how the, how the pulse response might go. So you get an immediate response, let's suppose, and you think, eh, it looks like that. But you don't know how tall it is, and you don't know what the decay is, right? So there's some things you don't know about it. And so you say, well, let's take a time series in which there's an event here, an event here, and an event here. Well, this one would look like this. But since there's a second one, it goes up just as much as the first one. And that would be what you would expect to come out of it. So this is your social variable here. Now, you have an actual time series data on what the, the social response was, OK? And so you choose the shape of these things, in other words, those values of those parameters, so as to match as closely as possible the predicted and actual response of the social variable. And that's the way you then estimate those things. And there's a million variants of that, OK? So there could be delay, you know, and heck of different shapes and all kinds of stuff. So it's just a way to deal with the decay and the delay and that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. The fraction of what? The why the fraction of, is consumed by agriculture is over, I don't think it's 95, I think it's 75. Yeah, so, so the number, um, uh, we ought to take a look at the slides, because that sounds to me like there's a mismatch. I think the answer is it's over 75, but over 75, over 95 is definitely over 75 <laughs> also. And what it amounts to is that if you look at the amount of water withdrawn from the environment and used, Water uh, for irrigation is co-equal, roughly, with water for cooling, particularly power plant cooling. Those big cooling towers next to a power plant, those things that are shaped like that, you know, with uh, like an inverted beer glass. And, but the point is that most of the cooling water doesn't evaporate. It just um, warms up, and they put it back in the river. All right, whereas irrigation actually returns essentially all of it to the atmosphere. And so if you look at the water that actually is drawn out of the environment and never put back, it makes irrigation the overwhelming dominant cause. 
there are all kinds of places in which the fraction is way over 95%, okay? So I think the global average, if you look in the slides, is about 75, but you know, in California, you know, it's, it's essentially all, you know, be 95%. Uh, yeah, it, it's, um, it depends on when in the year it is. If the, the way it works is that if the canopy is, if you look from a drone's eye view, if you can see ground, then some is coming off the ground and some is coming out of the leaves. If you can only see leaves, it's all coming out of the leaves. Yeah. Yeah, there's a picture with a bunch of skulls in it and stuff. So there's, there would be several components of that. So what would the first component be? If you wanted to say um, there was a sixth mass extinction, mass extinction has to be defined in some way. How do you think you'd define it? Anybody on that? Have there been any other mass extinctions? Yeah, they're historical mass extinctions, right? Like the, like the comet or asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs, right? And so we have a picture in the fossil record about how many species die, right? And it's the vast majority. Like 75%, there's that number again, up to maybe 99%, right? And so you know that mass extinctions in the past there's six biggies or five biggies, depending on how you count and how far back you go, are responsible for killing the majority of species in the world, all right? And so to define an anthropogenic mass extinction by those terms, so first set the scale, there's a scale, you'd have to show that humans were on track to do that. Now, are we on track to do that? Yeah, so, so there are a couple of pieces in, in the lecture, if you go back through it, that would allow you to answer that question. You'd say, well, how many have we currently driven extinct? And how much higher is the extinction rate than it was historically? How much of that is, are we responsible for? And it's maybe 100 times higher. And it's maybe... Um, climate change might boost it up, though, another thousand-fold. And so if we absolutely went crazy and didn't, and emitted fossil fuels, even though that now we have some cheaper alternatives, we could probably pull it off, okay? If you look at everything there, you get up into that territory with the majority, right, by wiping out the rainforest and so on. Remember, business as usual with just the land area, if you eventually come into equilibrium with the number of species for the land, the amount of habitat's been destroyed, it's 11%, right? And so we're kind of below threshold. Certainly if we solve the climate problem and don't expand agriculture, we're way below threshold. And even that 11% requires that we never figure out how to grow the food we need on even less land, right? And we, you know, we have this incredibly wasteful use where in the United States, most of the grain goes to cattle. So the point is that given the change in technology that we've seen and the meat substitutes that are likely coming, it's kind of hard to believe we're gonna pull off an anthropogenic sixth extinction. Yeah, we don't know much, but, but um, you know, there would have to be a, um, uh, a change in the pH or something that was dramatic. And the thing is that we've, we've seen that before. So it depends on how fast it happens and so on. And so uh, make no mistake, if we really tried, we could pull it off. 
All right, we're, we're you know, we, we could do it. And there's always the possibility that, that as Simona just said, that you know, something we don't understand could cause some sort of a cascade failure. But right now it doesn't look like that, okay? So, you know, so many species are more resilient than you think, and it's really hard to drive something extinct. You know, we've only succeeded, I think, in driving one species of fish extinct in all human history. And for, oh, about 50 years in the Philippines, there were islands that fished only with dynamite. And as soon as they stopped, their reefs immediately reassembled. It's really hard to get them all, right? Yes? Yeah, well, what would you think would be the difference? Why, why is there only one fish extinct and so many mammals? Yeah, and in the oceans right now, what's our primary activity in the oceans? What do we do in the oceans other than like drive across it in ships? Yeah, we fish. And the fishing is the equivalent of hunting on land, right? Has hunting driven any um, species extinct? Yeah, zillions. Woolly mammoths and, you know, it's all throughout history. Remember those graphs where when the upright ape evolved uh, projectile weapons, you got a bit of a mass extinction, but it took them some time, and the animals probably evolved to fear. But when they busted out into Eurasia, they caused a mass extinction, and then they did it in North and South America. They did it when they got to Australia. They did it when they got to Hawaii. Every place, every time they show up, you know, they get to, you know, to, to Mauritius, and you, the dodo goes extinct. So the point is we're land predators. And we can, we're good at that. Oh, the fish, you can't see where they are, all right? And so it's only now with sonar that we're starting to get good enough, maybe, to do it. But even then, it's pretty hard. Whales, we could have done, because they have to surface. <laughs> yeah. And we may end up making the Atlantic and Pacific right whales extinct. And there's a tiny porpoise in the Gulf of California that is down to half dozen or eight individuals, and that's almost certainly gonna go. Yes. Decreases what regionally? Yeah, so, so global warming, um, what does it do to the wet and dry places? So there it goes. Regionally, you'll get drying in some places. Oh, why is it? Well, so, so making the wet places wetter and the dry places drier is a little bit tricky, all right? That's a complicated argument, in fact. The idea that it would make some places drier Global warming rearranges the distribution of rainfall around the world. And so that means that some places that we're gonna get drier and some places are gonna get wetter, right? And so regionally there will be some drying. Why there is, um, why it makes wet places wetter is that the temperature goes up, the air rises more, the rising air cools and drops its moisture. It's more energy for evaporation and so on. Why it makes dry places drier is a little bit tricky and it has to do with the way the atmosphere circulates in response to that rising air and the dropping water and yada yada, right? So there's, a, there's an argument. And even, and, and that kind of comes from Princeton, by the way. There's a, the people who figured that out live here and they still even argue about it. Although it's true globally, if you look over land, it's not really that true. There are certainly places that are getting drier. 
the, and sadly, the southwestern U.S. is one of those places, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know, we've known how to do that for a long time. And so places that we could have dammed, we've pretty much done it, right? And also, of course, now there's also pushback against it. We're tearing dams down, not putting them back up again. And another thing that, that I didn't mention is that when you dam up a stream, um, what happens is that behind it, it starts to fill up with silt that's traveling in the, in the river and is kept in the water column by the, by the rapidly moving water, the turbulent tumbling of the water. And when it slows down, all the silt drops out. And so the reservoir then fills up. And then the dam's no good anymore. And so we've wrecked a lot of the decent places for it because we've been using water power since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, even before fossil fuels. Yes. Right, so we've got a good way to make electricity now, right? And what we need is a way to store it. And one way to store it is to use the energy from the wind and solar, the electricity, to make a burnable fuel that you can burn when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, right? Um, you could also store it in a battery, but a chemical fuel is a great way to do it if you can store it. Also, as a society, remember the five characteristics of a, of a net zero energy system? You have to have a way to make net zero power, you have to have a way to deal with intermittency, you have to have a, a fuel for high industrial heat, remember that one? So burning hydrogen is a fuel for high industrial heat, so that Electrolysis would turn wind and solar into one-stop shopping for energy. You kind of get everything but the carbon sinks that you need to handle the greenhouse gases that you can't quite mitigate yet, like some of the N2O from agriculture. We need to put the fertilizer on or we're not going to feed humanity. Some methane comes from agriculture also, right? And we can't quite get rid of all of it. Rice paddy agriculture, we can get rid of some, but not all of it, maybe half. So everything but the carbon sinks, just about, you could get out of wind and solar if only you had an electrolysis machine that was cheap enough to purchase. It's always cheap to operate because you're using it when you have too much wind and solar. Remember, you install so much wind and solar that during the high demand season and high demand days, days where there's big air conditioning or big heat burdens or whatever, you have enough to deal with then. And that means there are all kinds of days when you're over, you know, you got over capacity. And that electricity then, the price of it, the marginal electron is worth nothing, right? So you can sell it for nothing. And so you can operate the electrolysis machine really inexpensively. Now, of course, the price will go up as you have electrolysis that makes hydrogen and the hydrogen is valuable, and then it'll go up a little bit. But the point is that to invade the economy, an electrolysis machine just has to be cheap to buy, not cheap to operate. Yes. Uh, ways to measure acclimation? Well, what would be a way to measure it? Right. So if you, if you take a look at the European heat wave of 2001, it killed 70,000 people. There was just as bad a heat wave either last year or the year before. I can't remember which. And almost nobody died. And it's because they put cooling centers in all the European capitals. Right, that's acclimation. 
And there are other ways to measure it, right? You could see, for instance, that um, places like Japan that suffer lots of typhoons, when you look at the impact of typhoons, say, on GDP or death or something like that, there's not very much impact. Whereas places that don't get very many get a lot. Um, yeah, so, 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 so how do solutions to the food and biodiversity problem compete for land? I bet somebody can answer that question. That's exactly right. So the only rain-fed places we have left that haven't been exploited for agriculture, overwhelmingly, they're forests now. You look at the Great Plains, you know, it's amber waves of grain, right? So, so the tropical rainforest is the big place in the tropics where the food demand is going up that you could expand into, and that, of course, hurts biodiversity. And if you wanted to restore habitats, conversely, if you wanted to restore habitats to, to make more habitat for some endangered ecosystem or species, like the Atlantic coastal forest in Brazil, well, you could in principle take it from Sao Paulo, but that real estate's really expensive, right? The cheaper way to do it would be to take agriculture in the region out of production. So they, they directly compete then. To, to estimating the food, the growth in food demand from 2005 to 2050, or from, I, so, so, sorry, I'm, I'm just, with the mask, I couldn't quite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what would be the single biggest driver do you remember from, from lecture? You can look in that lecture and you'll see what the single biggest driver is. Is it population growth? Yeah, well, so the population right now is over 7 billion, losing towards 8. Most of the um, UN estimates now have the maximum population size of humanity mid-century, maybe at 8.5 or so. Used to be 10 or 11. Looks like we're losing interest in reproducing as women become more powerful. And not losing interest in reproduction, just losing interest in huge families, right? And, and, so, and so that's a change, but it's not a, I think you get a doubling out of, right? And so um, what's really the change? And the, the big driver, if you look, is that remember, when GDP per capita goes up, Calorie demand goes up a lot. Remember Tillman's studies? There are all those colored curves for the different kinds of countries. And why does it go up so much? Yeah, we're shifting to animal protein. That's the reason. We don't eat many more calories, eat a few more, but not that many more. You'll notice that the per capita demand in Tillman's graphs climbs to 10 thousand calories, like an Olympic athlete or an Iditarod sled dog. And I mean, nobody, I, I think we pulled the class. There was one person who was, thought he, it was a he, was eating 10,000 calories um, a day. But, they, but that person obviously was um, burning a lot. <laughs> yeah. Probably the meat. Well, so in China, it's, it's pork, pork and chicken. Right. I mean, China has to have a national strategic pork reserve to keep people from rioting. Yeah, they don't care about beef nearly as much. But pork is a real symbol of, of uh, the good life in China.
Yes. Yeah, well, so it's on a slide. <laughs> just look at it. It says, these are the five characteristics of a net zero energy system. There's a whole slide that just does that. So you should look at that. I mean, we could look at it, but it's a good idea to look at it. Yeah, so what is the species area relationship? Yeah, and the way you do that is you like, um, if you're a biologist in the 1960s and you like to travel, you know, at first it was bird watchers. And, and the bird watchers would go to like to every island in the South Pacific. Who wouldn't want to do that? And then they watch birds, and they count how many bird species there are. And then they graph the area of the island against the number of bird species, right? There's dots, one for each island. And what you discover is that there's a very um, striking accelerating increase. Um, uh, well, I'm sorry, a very striking decelerating uh, increase so that the number of species on the island is a constant, constant which depends on what group you're looking at, times the square root of the square root of the area, okay? So if the, if the island has 10,000 square kilometers, the square root of the square root is 10. And that means that a 10,000 square kilometer island is going to have 10 times more species than a one kilometer squared island whose square root of the square root is still one. So you get 10 on the one hand and one times the other, right? The other and the constant times them both. And so that increase with roughly a power of one quarter is characteristic of all the different groups. And it's true of habitat islands as well as like regular islands. And so then you can use that to say, well, geez, if we cut down half the rainforest, so now the area of the rainforest is half what it used to be, we could use that relationship to figure out how many species are going to be uh, lost or what fraction of species are going to be lost. OK? And so if it was dropped from um, uh, um, uh, 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 10,000 square kilometers to 5,000 square kilometers, How much, what fraction of the species are you going to lose? We'd have to plug it in and use a calculator, but the answer is uh, just over 20%, because it's the quarter through to a half, which is almost exactly 1 over 1 1.2. Okay. All right, so... Um, so, so you can do that and do a calculation. Now, what's wrong with that calculation? Do you remember? Right. So we knocked down 99% of the rainforest in Puerto Rico, and so far we've lost a couple species, right? And that's because it evidently takes a long time. And conditions change. Remember, there's a, remember the Kutznets curve of deforestation as people get richer? Deforestation goes up, and then it goes down. From here to the Mississippi River used to be essentially entirely deforested just about 100 years ago, a little more than 100, 110. And now it's 75% forested. And so a calculation done in 1910, if they'd known about that relationship, would have been wrong for that reason, right? So it overstates how many species you're going to lose. Probably, of course, now it could be that you go the other way. You cut down all the rest of the forest, okay? Now, there's, not, there's not a lot of evidence of that happening now, but there are places where we still have. You know, the 100 nations just signed this no more deforestation agreement in COP26. Whether or not they live up to it, we don't know, but there's $20 billion on the table right now, so. That'll go some way towards halting it. Yes. Yeah, so so um so the governments are already investing in direct air capture. 
all right? So in the U.S., one of the sneaky laws that got passed during Trump's first, Trump's only term, um, was, um, was a direct air capture law. And so right now, the federal government will pay you to do direct air capture. And that's the main reason that there is an ecosystem, a startup ecosystem, that and the private market. There are companies that want to claim they have zero net emissions, and so they'd like to do direct air capture. We didn't talk about this, but there's a, you know, you know the, um, the, the, the company Stripe? You know, you know what Stripe is? I guess some sort of a payment company. Does anybody know what Stripe is? What does Stripe do? What kind of techies are you people? Come on. <laughs> well, I don't remember either, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I have no idea. I just know the people. I know the Stripe people. In fact, I got an email from the guy today. The, the, um, they're the biggest purchaser and arranger of purchaser of direct air capture in the world. And it's like hundreds of millions of dollars already. And their go-to method is they take um, plants and they, you don't need to know this, they partially combust them and turn them into, uh, it's, it's a thing called fast pyrolysis. You hit them for like three minutes with 900 degrees Celsius and it turns the plants half into this thing called biochar, which you can use to put on your garden or your farm and make it more fertile. And the other half makes something that looks just like crude oil, but it smells like barbecue, okay? And they take that and they inject it back into used up oil reservoirs, all right? And it's geologically stable in those things. And so that's taking CO2 from the air and putting it into an oil reservoir. So it's absolutely bulletproof and it scales. The problem is it costs 600 bucks a ton, okay? But the companies are so desperate to be net zero for their advertising and for whatever other reason that people are willing to pay for it. The goal is to get it down under 100, maybe down under 50. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's so many groups now. Um, the Build Back, Be the infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better bill has tons of work on that. The DOE is dumping scads of money into it. Um, so, yeah, it, it, there, there's there's real activity there, and um, it's going to come down a lot. The question is just how far. Yes. So um, if the exam is good, we would expect you to integrate exams or integrate um, lectures. All right. And and but in practice, it's with a course this diverse, it's pretty hard to do that well. OK. So the first thing to do is to make sure you understand and have good answers for and are able to meet all of the take home objectives from my lectures and any other ones that you've got them for. Because I can tell you right now, that's where I'm gonna be getting my questions. And if I look for something that integrates across lectures, I'm gonna link one or two of those to something else. Okay, and so a good way to study is that first make sure you can do that, right? And then a really good way to learn any subject is to play mind association games with yourself. To pick an objective and to pick another objective from somewhere else and to think of the links that you have to establish to get from one to another. All right. So, you know, an answer might be um, you, uh, the characteristics of a net zero energy system and what's available to do it and how much does it cost and how does that relate to the goals of Paris and so on, right? Like that. And I, I can answer for... Yeah, I was going to say, so the the... 
and, and some too, I think, with the economics. But if you look for the lecture purposes, you know, I, I had a few lectures, and then Colin gave one on, on um, activism. And so for at least the majority of mine, you might want to think about the questions that you have examples that are coming out of Professor Pakala's lectures that can be utilized uh, to illustrate your comprehension of the normative concepts that you're being asked. So one way to study for at least the, the moral portion is to look back at the slides. Most everything is actually, not most, all of it's going to come with or from uh, at least what the slide is pointing you towards. And so most of those are drawing certain kinds of distinctions, right, between particular kinds of approaches or views or theorizing about um, whether it's moral arguments towards divestment and there's kind of two camps to it or whether or not you're looking at um, the differences between a, a green growth model, a degrowth model, an A growth model. And you can utilize other examples that have come up in the other lectures in uh, showing the support for the kinds of ways in which you're defining the concepts and showing the distinctions between them. So you should be able to like define different kinds of views, have the technical terms right um, understood, and then be able to understand differences and overlaps and similarities and where are the moral disagreements happening. But that you can do so by bringing in some some of that um, from the other lectures. A great question that I didn't ask would yeah. have been <laughs> for the solutions to the food, water, and biodiversity problems. Which elements of the technological suggestions that I told you about are consistent with a degrowth model. Yeah. All right, that would have been a good question. So it's not on the exam, but that's the sort of thing that if we really were on the ball, we would yeah. be asking, okay? But yeah, if you, if you realize, you know, so it, there's gonna be things like, for example, on degrowth, A growth, and, and green growth, for those kinds of views, they're sharing similar concerns. So you want to know the points of divergence of where they're at. And you could, you know, take on examples of what might fit within a picture that would be justified by people holding one view over another. And if you remember, we talked a little bit about sort of the Green New Deal and the stuff that's moved in to build back better. And uh, that at least most folks arguing in the green growth versus degrowth and A growth they all see that Green New Deal or Build Back Better principles could fit within any of those models. So sometimes there's this thought that like, oh, it's only a green growth model or it's only a, you know, suggesting a degrowth model. And it, it's not necessarily so. And the reason for that, uh, as these theorists were arguing, is that growth doesn't inherently need to be defined vis-a-vis -vis GDP. So there can be other ways in which we're measuring growth that makes it not like inherently a bad thing um, as a measurement, so that's an example of right, like one policy proposal that that could fit within these different methods. But you'd have to know what what was being proposed to see whether or not it would classify as one or another. So, for instance, the shift to electric cars is cheaper, but it also saves more energy. It, it, it cheaper. It's about the same cost, but you're only using half the total energy because electric motors are so much more efficient, all right? And so by some measures, you're reducing, right? But in terms of the energy services that you're being provided, there's, well, the energy services are actually better in my view. It's faster, quieter, safer, more reliable, all that stuff. That might even be an example of an A-growth model where you're getting, you're decoupling, right, uh, the, the issue of growth tied to, you know, problematic carbon emission stuff. Uh, but there might still be growth to some extent, right? You're not cutting production entirely. So you can do it in multiple for, ways. For what it's worth, when we did the Net Zero America project here, we decided that there was no way it was going to sell, certainly not to the American people, and certainly even worse to Congress, and even doubly, triply, quadruply to congressional conservatives, if we ask Americans to do with less of anything, OK? And so, and so we specifically supplied business as usual energy services with uh, net zero energy systems. In Europe, they really expect people, and the people expect to do with less. 
It's, a, it's like an inherent cultural difference. Europeans believe, uh, well, public Europeans. Opinion. Yeah, the public opinion is behind the idea that, that, that Europeans must sacrifice and uh, America, in the climate debate in, Amer in the US has absolute, the word sacrifice is never in it unless somebody's trying to stop it. All right. Yeah. Sure, right. So um, an A growth model, you might want to think about it as trying to get the best of both the degrowth and the A growth models. So if you remember degrowth arguments, we're arguing that we simply can't get to hit the targets that we're needing to 1.5 or whatever in the time that is required of us to do so if we continue production, right? Or if we continue, uh, you know, a model of the economy that's based on growth and particularly they have in mind GDP, right? So the degrowthers are saying, Growth is antithetical to hitting these targets, so we need to, as our number one priority, right, stop that kind of activity. Green growthers are going to say, no, we can continue to have production and activity, but the main goal is to decouple problematic right, forms of growth, those ones that are going to contribute to further emissions and that sort of thing. So there's an inherent disagreement right, on the green growthers and the degrowthers about how we can get to scale quick enough and how we can you know, hit those thresholds quick enough. The A growther is gonna come in and say, look, we don't need to be um, allergic to notions of growth. We might wanna change our understanding of what growth can entail so that we may not necessarily tie growth to merely looking at whether GDP is being increased. We actually wanna see if the other kinds of things that are valuable uh, for us to have a good life and a social life are increased, and make sure that in getting that kind of production done, decoupling is happening. So it's going to take on decoupling of making sure production is not tied to things that are going to exacerbate the climate crisis, but that we might still be okay if the result, for example, is going to be um, increases in the kinds of like green technology that we're going to be needing. The way to though have an A growth model, and this is what some of the arguments that came up in the reading, is you need a fair amount of um, support and context in order to achieve this. So a lot of those models are saying like, hey, we should pay people to work less, right? So maybe a UBI is coming in, a universal basic income that can help supply that. We should, uh, you know, separate out your health care tied to your uh, job. So you would be seeing a fairly robust social safety net coming into this kind of a model. And the moral arguments for it is that the costs to growth that might happen on the GDP side on an A growth model are only going to be felt most likely by elites, right? So like rich people can buy one less yacht and that would be morally justifiable, right? If it was, the, those costs were to be felt by wage earners, they could be offset by, for example, um, paying people uh, you know, a UBI so they could select whether or not to work or whether they could make part-time work more sustainable. So a lot of in this proposal, you see arguments for like a shortened work week, for example. So overall, especially in you know, brown industries or you know, dirty industries, uh, you might see a decrease in the type of activity but see incentives to increase activity in like green technology, right? So, so on that model, it's not like stop all growth or that like capitalism is inherently, you know, um, antithetical to hitting these, these uh, climate targets. It's that we need a new way to sort of define what we understand as like economic progress and that sort of thing. But yeah, you, you can't do it without like probably a, a still a relatively progressive sort of restructuring of, of what the social systems look like. Did that help clarify a little bit?
So electrolysis consists of um, sticking an anode and a cathode on opposite sides of a membrane that has the right characteristics. And what will happen is the oxygen will, the, the, the electricity will force the H2O to disassociate into H2 and O2. And the O2 will come out one side and the H2 will come out the other. So it's a way to make a burnable fuel, hydrogen, directly from renewable electricity. And then the hydrogen, we didn't say this, but you can store it in um, big tanks, but hydrogen turns out to be really hard to store. And it's because the molecule is so tiny, it finds its way out of every little crack in the welds and stuff. And so it leaks out into the atmosphere, which is bad. And it also, because if it blows up, it has a supersonic shock wave, and it has a flame you can't see, so it can burn you without seeing it. So the idea is you're never going to have it in your house, right? It's just like bad. And so one of the um, main ways to deal with it is to convert it into ammonia. All right, now ammonia may sound like a horrible thing. But ammonia isn't actually much more dangerous to deal with than diesel fuel, and you can burn it in an engine, right, and just ship it as a liquid. That's the way we make, um, we make fertilizer um, that way. 2% of the energy of the world goes into making hydrogen right now to make fertilizer. So we really know how to do that at scale. H2O, you get water vapor back. That's it. That's all you get. You, you know, if, if you burn it in air, um, so the, the problem with burning stuff in air is that air is mostly nitrogen. And so you make N2O and NOx and stuff, so you make air pollution that way. And so um, if you burn a fuel like methane in air, you get NOx. And if you burn a fuel like hydrogen in air, you get NOx. And so one thing you'd like to do is to have an air separation unit um, and then burn it in pure oxygen, then no NOx. There's a fancy pants gas power plant called an alum cycle that's running in Texas right now that does that with a very slick way. And you can capture the CO2 and have no air pollution um, at the same cost as a modern gas plant. So if there's a future for fossil fuel, that's it. No, there's, a, there's a, a 50 megawatt one, which is like a little power plant, but still a big machine. It's been running for maybe five or six years in, just outside of Houston. And the firm now is um, one of the hot properties. And so they're constructing full-size power plants, maybe a half dozen, almost all of them in the US. It's a firm called Net Power. You can look them up. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so the, quite, I mean, it's a comment, really, about antibiotic resistance and what's going on there. And the answer is that um, there you have two um, opposing um, problems, right? So, um, in, so in the organic uh, food arguments, in my view, you're trading off community against high production. Okay, that, that's what you're doing. Maybe even health against high production. But, but you are decreasing production. And the question is, in a, in a hungry world, can we afford to, to cut production? And so you're, you're trading off one harm for another, right? And that's why I ask, you know, do you need to sacrifice your health, right, to, to solve the food problems of others? Um, antibiotic resistance does increase the productivity of cattle, but at the cost of making people sick. So it's kind of similar, right? Because, I mean, you make antibiotic-resistant bacteria that then invade human populations, so, you know, the bacteria exchange plasmids and that sort of thing. 
And almost everybody who looks at this seriously, just all the scientists think we ought to stop. All right? We just ought to stop. That it's like crazy to leave ourselves defenseless against bacteria just so that we can goose up the productivity of cattle in feedlots a little bit. That just seems crazy to me. And every scientist I know thinks that's crazy. Whereas this organic versus um, high production f agriculture is, is uh, you, you know, you'd find the scientists who acknowledge both sides of these arguments generally. The one thing that cuts across both problems is yeah, and certainly if you know. got if you cut out <laughs> beef with meat substitutes, <laughs> it yeah. was, that problem also goes away. Yeah, yeah that's both. a good point. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you saw both. Yes. Well, renewables, right? So to make a renewable energy system. You need electricity, zero carbon electricity. Now, renewables do that, right? And you need a fuel. You need a fuel for high heat, like steel and a lot of other industrial processes. And you also might need a fuel to store energy, to burn in a turbine, to make electricity when the sun isn't is shining, right? And the wind isn't blowing. There are other ways to store energy. You could do it in a battery, but currently we don't have batteries that could deal with seasonal storage, whereas we do know how to store large amounts of gases for long periods of time. We do that now. Natural gas has big seasonal demand, and the gas is actually produced year-round and pumped into caverns in Kansas and compressed in a whole season's worth of gas is stored there. And, and um, and not without cost. I think one of the towns near Lawrence, Kansas blew up. I was going to say, one of Lawrence, Kansas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Gas is actually dangerous. I actually, my, my mother's father got blown up when the whole city of R Richmond, Indiana, the whole downtown blew up from a natural gas leak. So it does happen, but but um, that's an aside. The, the uh, um, electrolysis is a way to make a fuel, right, from renewable electricity. And so cheap electrolysis kills both those birds with one stone. And it also has the potential to handle the intermittency problem. Yes. Well, what is the intermittency problem? Right. It could be when it's nighttime, there's no sunshine. So you have to have a way to produce, to compensate for that solar electricity through the, the nighttime. Currently, the way we do that with the marginal uh, solar that's coming on the grid is with big batteries. We've got great, big, really good six-hour batteries now. Cost-effective. They're going in all over the place, selling like hotcakes. Nice startup, in fact, that started here. It's in Elizabeth, New Jersey, does this. But then there's the seasonal problem where in some seasons you use twice as much energy in others. No real way. I mean, it's hard to store seasons worth. We do with natural gas. In principle, you might do it with some hydrogen. But wind and solar are now so cheap that you can afford to install twice too much and just leave some of it idle. And it still is cost competitive, right? So the only problem really left is this thing called the doldrums problem, where on continent-wide scales, for periods of days to a couple of weeks, once in a while, it's hazy out, and it's like winter, so you get crappy sun, and the wind just doesn't blow. The Germans actually have a word for it. I can't remember what it is, but it's some German-sounding word. <laughs> okay, and, and so that's a big problem, because it happens rarely, but you can't all of a sudden not have power. Like people will go crazy if you say, I've given you this great renewable energy system, and oh, guess what? Your heat isn't going to work for the next two weeks in winter, right? They go bananas with good reason. That's like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so what do we do about that? In the net zero America model, by 2030, the way we deal with that, with an 80% renewable electricity system, 
is by throttling up the gas plants we already paid for. We keep them online. We keep them idle most of the time, but they're all just sitting there, and so we just throttle them up, which is why Biden's 2030 goals are realistic. To get beyond that 80%, though, you're going to have to decarbonize those gas plants, and that's where the expensive part comes. So the goal of 100% renewable by 2035 that Biden's team has is not really, um, well, it's more politics than um, technological readiness. Let me put it that way. Okay. Yeah, um, um, I think I have two 15-point questions and two 10-point questions that you have to answer for a total of 50 from my, from my lectures. And I give you six total questions that you can choose four from. Yeah, I have, for mine, I have at least one choice for every question, and they're 10-point questions. Yeah, there are no, some no choice parts of it, but but uh, for my fifty, there's some choice. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I mean we expanded the time for maximal flexibility for people, but the sort of joke was like if you were taking five hours to do it, like you really should be spending your time doing other things. Not a joke, probably serious, but it, I mean, it shouldn't require more than three hours. I do believe though that if you sit down, you have to take it all in one sitting, right? Is that still? Or is it right? But can you like sign out and go back on or? No, oh, okay, just take okay. the, take the time. Oh, that's right. You're trying to take it. Yeah, but you know, th this is not a five hour exam. All right, it, it's, you know, some people will finish the exam in two hours or less, okay? It's just we're giving everybody long because some people need more, because there can be internet snafus. You know, there's a whole bunch of becauses, right? And we just don't think, uh, you know, not looking at the material, which is a violation of the honor code, right, to look at the material is what we care about, not how fast, you know, you know, in your life, it's not going to matter if it takes you, you know, if you're thinking about how to vote, you don't have to decide in the next half hour if you've done your homework. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So the logistical problems that this should obviate. Mm -hmm. right, so that's the idea that they can type their answers in, right? Yeah. And better to grade. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, um, that means you, uh, while studying for finals, you have to learn how to use Adobe Acrobat Pro if you don't know how to use it. And you also have to install it in advance because, like, the worst mistake you could make is to decide I'm going to use a piece of software I never used before, <laughs> type everything in, and then not know how to get your answers out. So I would be, yeah, I, I would, I would, I, I would have dress rehearsaled if you were gonna do that. So you cannot reformat your PDF in any way. You 
can't, you, if you type your answers into Microsoft Word, you're going to have to copy paste them into the answer spot in, in the PDF, in the original PDF. So the PDF. Yeah, so the PDF just can't change at all. You can, like, what do you mean can't change? can't change? Scanned it. And then you scanned it. So you're still, like, the question is in the same exact spot on the paper, and the answer is in the same exact spot. Yeah, we just want the, the answer and the question to be in, this, in the right spot. Yeah. So if you were to put the document into Microsoft Word, you would end up changing the spacing and pushing questions on other pages. That wouldn't work. Gradescope won't read it. Does that make sense? You can do it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Gradescope has not gotten easier since last year. I got to say that, right? And it's, the software seems to be moving in the wrong direction. It turns out to be really valuable in this course because one of the failure modes for a, a, a final exam like this is that previous to doing it this way, we had to break everyone's exams, like literally rip everyone's exam apart because we have different, um, you know, th th they aren't, there are six different exams and parts of them are graded here and parts of them are graded there. And the chances of losing or mismatching were just extraordinary and so we, would tell everybody to put their names on the top of every single page, but then like 60% of people didn't some of the time, right? So there would be orphaned pages, it's just a freaking nightmare, okay? And so we've never had a disaster, but that's only because we were lucky. So to protect you, we decided we had to do something that was this way, but it is a pain in the behind, I gotta say. Yeah, we tried all kinds of, anyway, so this is, this is a problem, we acknowledge it, but it's, it's the, the goal is to prevent a worse problem. Yeah, so if you took the midterm, you're in the same process, unless you had a problem with the midterm in which Robbie's correcting what that problem would have been, and it would have been if you were formatting. It is true that there were, there were, when I was grading it, there would be like things that look blank and then you'd try to like poke around the exam yeah. and you'd find it stuck somewhere, yeah. Yeah, so rule of thumb is don't format the PDF yourself, just put your answer in the original PDF and however you can do that, whether it's handwriting or putting text, cutting and pasting and then scanning, <laughs> analog. Taking a picture with your phone. Taking a picture, yeah. Take a picture of the front. And glue it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You got five hours now, so <laughs> if you own glue, <laughs> have at it. <laughs> Might be easier to learn Adobe at that point. <laughs> so has anybody got um, concerns about how this is going to work? Everybody, um, how many had trouble with the midterm in this way? Do you know what you're going to do now? All right. Well, that's good. That's good. So we've had three that had problems with the midterm. All three know what they're going to do. <laughs> so everybody knows what they're going to do. And again, I do apologize for the fact that this isn't any more flexible, but um, my assistant, Christina, has looked at you know, and gone and, you know, gone to seminars and gone to OIT, and there just isn't an alternative that is um, easier and is safe. Question over here. Sure, I'll just draw this diagram again. Um, or maybe I won't draw it again. I'll just make the points look different. Let's suppose that you say this is the pulse response. It goes up this high, and then it decays in this way. 
let's suppose you have a time series in which there were three events. Let's call them three hurricanes. So there's the first one, and it's going on down. But then a second one happens, so you add this much on again, you see? Add another pulse on. And now they're both decaying down. And then the third one comes, and it jumps again, OK? Now let's suppose that the data looked like this. Right, the data looks kind of like this. You got a bunch of points, and then, and you say, well, that's a really stupid pulse response function because it says there, it should last forever, and it doesn't last forever. And so you'd say, oh, okay, well, that's wrong. It really should decay this fast. And then when I do this, it's going to go through the points, you see? So by having a pulse response function, you can compare it to data and ask yourself, how would I improve the predicted social response to match data? So how would I adjust the height of this thing and its rate of decay, for example? And in so doing, you can actually estimate how much the social response function bounces up, like it could be the death rate, and how long that response lasts, all right? Well, it is a high-end method. Yeah, it's just a high-end method. The thing is that when we talked about high-end methods, again, I'm not going to ask you questions about the pulse response method. It's just a lot of people wonder. It's like, sounds kind of weird. You're going to have a hurricane, and it's going to lead to increased violence or a change in GDP. Doesn't that last a long time? How do you disentangle it? If it's a birth rate, shouldn't that happen nine months later? You know, that kind of stuff. And what I wanted to point out was that when you're doing the high-end method in practice, a lot of times there can be a delay and also the response can be ongoing. And so when you get the next episode, it can look like there's even more violence and it's because you've got carryover violence from the last time plus some more that's just been added. And this is a way to deal with those with the fact that extreme weather is coming in pulses, but the responses are lasting a long time, okay? And so it's just statistics. It's fancy pants regression, all right? And if you want to learn how to do it, you take a modern you know, statistics course. And, and it's pretty straightforward now, but Although I think you still need probably to write your own software to do this. I don't think there's anybody that's got a custom package for this kind of thing yet. Although maybe they do, I just don't know where it is. And I wouldn't trust it <laughs> if I did. Um, so, right, if you, if you look at the slides um, on, uh, on the lecture that I did on that, in one of the earlier slides it shows point of overlap. And so in those kinds of similarities, there are, you know, the shared goals, right, to be changing our patterns and our habits in order to hit these climate targets. So um, it's important to recognize, um, and I think I mean, maybe it's obvious to some, but it kind of goes without saying that some of the goals of, of these models, right, are, are shared. So they're, they're not necessarily, you know, right out the gate incompatible. Where you start seeing the, the divergence and the incompatibility again is uh, green growthers are mostly committed to the fact that any kind of commitment to growth, regardless of any of the kind of, you know, social change and things like that would be happening, would uh, not be able to get us to the targets quick enough. So they see it, in fact, as a roadblock. And that's why there's this idea that the priority should be to centralize, like, stopping that kind of growth, not, like, slowing it or anything like that.
Oh, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Do you know where? Yeah. I was, yeah. Oh, well, if, if we're talking about like very basic, uh, I think it's more referring to the A growth that you should be having, so, so that might be a typo, but that there should be uh, social safety nets or certain kinds of other uh, support mechanisms in place in order to facilitate this happening. And you know, green growth models might actually have that involved too, but predominantly the degrowth and the A growth idea is that you can't do this uh, with the current systems that like, for example, we'd have in the US because you would need to have certain kinds of things like healthcare decoupled from employment, uh, potentially a UBI or some sort of, because the cuts or the costs that were gonna come from suddenly, let's say, stopping growth on the D growth model or for at least changing where growth is happening on the A growth model might be felt right across wage earners. And so there should be some sort of way to compensate those kinds of losses and you can do so through different kinds of social programs, right? Um, so the UBI again being one of them. Uh, the others, right, on the A growth, you can get creative, which is literally like paying people to take time off <laughs> or um, making sure that people have a certain amount of fixed income so that they could choose to work less. And then when you take on partial employment or part-time employment, you're rewarded for doing so. But yeah, the, I guess the, the running argument is that like you can't have the status quo conditions, at least as that we would have in the US here in order to make these sorts of uh, models work. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I do think that um, when it comes to, so, so federal policy, I didn't really talk about this this much because I um, talked about other things, <laughs> but, I, but, but um, the, the Endangered Species Act is an amazing piece of legislation passed during the Nixon ad administration. And it, it says that if a species is declared to be endangered, then it must be saved no matter what the cost. That's what it actually says, all right? And ever since then, um, oh, uh, there, there's a part of the political spectrum that's been trying to dismantle that, that response. And, and so what, what creeps in is more and more sort of cost-benefit analysis. And so you're somehow trying to balance the value of the species against, against the, the alternative values. And those values are always um, uh, instrumental, okay? Whereas the Endangered Species Act, the way I read it originally, it doesn't seem instrumental at all, or you would never say no matter what the cost, right? It's like, this thing is valuable for its own sake, and it's, it's value to people, either that or it's so valuable, you know, if it's instrumental, it's so valuable that there is no conceivable cost that would be too high, which doesn't even make any sense, right? So, so I think that the Endangered Species Act, when it was passed, was an intrinsic values proposition. And I think now we've moved much more strongly towards an instrumental view of the value of biodiversity. Got Is that it. fair? Yeah, I think so. And, and I guess to take up part of the like growth, where the growth conversation comes in with this, um, at least I know for those uh, that are working on a growth, there, it's actually not antithetical to deep ecology principles, if you see the sort of like original theories that are coming out of deep ecology. The idea is that we can understand valuing without just having to do cost-benefit analysis, but also without having to do like a merely intrinsic or aesthetic value or something like that. So the idea is shifting um, like where the valuing is coming into play and what values we're actually favoring. So on the A-growth model, for example, this is why there's these arguments about um, shifting 
the measurements of growth away from GDP and instead looking at the kinds of things that we take to be valuable to um, both ecological and also you know, human welfare for, for that sake. So I know that um, Aaron James, who's writing on aid growth, also has this sort of notion of adaptive attunement and he's kind of refining these views that actually emerge out of kind of the older deep ecology principles and he takes an aid growth model kind of idea. So, so the idea is sort of repurposing or, or I guess re-articulating what we're taking as valuable, right? And, and being able to see that if we're able to cohere a little bit better with natural systems, that that itself would be a value worth preserving. And, there, and that is not meaning that that's contradictory to things also having instrumental value, right? It can, it can be differentially valued for that reason. So um, w one of the ways this, this comes into practice, just like around here, is the in the Net Zero America project, initially we just developed an energy system that met the energy demands of Americans under business as usual at the lowest possible cost that didn't emit anything, right? That's what we did. But then um, there's a woman named Erin Mayfield who is now a professor at Dartmouth. And um, she's an expert on um, vector-valued objective functions, all right? So it's gonna, so, so what she would do is say, okay, well, that's one goal. How much does it cost? Another goal is how many people are employed. Another goal is how healthy are the people. And another goal is what does this do for equity and diversity, all right? And so you can develop measures of all of those things. Now, an economist would want you to put them all in, in, the, in, in dollars, would convert them to dollars. Like, well, how much do you really value diversity? And let's put a dollar on it. And, and she says, and the people who do this say, no, that's just not possible to do. Because among other things, everybody has different ideas about what these things are. And so then, in a technical sense, what you do is you search for a thing called the Pareto frontier. And it's the set of strategies which are such that you can't do better than this set. And the set is such that if you do better in one thing, you do worse on something else. And so what it does is it exposes the ethical trade-offs that are involved and allows people to bring their own set, their own sort of frame, their own values to the argument by making it clear. And so this is an acknowledgement that everything isn't dollars, right? And a transparency of what we're, like what is being assumed, right, when you're coming into these kinds of calculations, right? So it, it renders visible the sort of value sets that we're taking in to these kinds of evaluations. It turns out that when you're horse trading in Congress, this is actually what people do. You know, because there'll be some group of people for whom the constituents think environmental justice is the most important thing, and they'll say, I want something here. And what they do is they argue for positions on a set of Pareto trade-offs, right? Yes. What are the concerns about what? Right, so, so look up at the organic and local food market, uh, food system, right? So there's all kinds of concerns. So one of Foley's biggest deals is that you have to increase production by increasing fertilizer application. And the goals of the organic local and local food market is to actually decrease um, uh, artificial fertilizer, right? And that will decrease yields. And so that's a good example of something that's outside it. Um, all kinds of dietary concerns, obesity, corn, um, eating local because you want to build a sense of community, um, you know, tons of, tons of stuff. Basically, the whole modern sort of trendy food movement inside the United States is, is, uh, is counter to that, that 
biggest part, that's 58% of Foley's solution. The, the, the business is about reducing waste everybody can get behind. And almost everybody's behind the idea of a diet shift, except for uh, cattle producers and a few others, right? But, but um, yeah, or people that just, yeah, the, yeah I guess there are some that are, that are behind it, that are against it. Yeah, there was the one experiment. It's the last slide in the lecture, I believe, on the um, on the the ethical problems associated with the food and the and the biodiversity problem, in which uh, uh, um, a woman, Erica Zavalita, I think her name is, in at uh, Zavalita, I think it's a. Um, uh, who, who's at Stanford, or was at Stanford at the time, um, asked, of all the species that have ever been looked at, how many is necessary for at least one ecosystem function? Because you need 10 for this one, and 10 for this one, and 10 for this one, and most of the species were responsible for at least maintaining some function. So that's one argument. If you believed that the species have intrinsic value, too, that's... Um, then, then the the question is moot. But that, like, and this is probably not for the exam, but there's also these arguments about like, what even preserving some sort of ecosystem looks like. So this idea of um, like invasives coming into a particular kind of ecosystem, with this idea of invasion at the heart of ecology, there's actually a lot of ethical assumptions in play. Um, that are now at least receiving pushback, especially even from moral philosophers about, like, is it relatively arbitrary at this point what we're even taking a certain ecosystem that we would want to preserve as it is? And maybe we ought to start refining this notion of, like, invaders, right? Especially if it's just a matter of an ecosystem changing rather than seeing just a um, changing away from a different status quo. Like, that may not necessarily be deterioration right, in the way that the sort of health concern of the ecosystem is. So there, there's some really interesting philosophy going on right now, pushing back on even this idea of like, what, what, what does it mean to preserve an ecosystem, right, from a particular kind of perspective? And, and to what extent is that arbitrary? I don't know if you see. Yeah, I, I mean, I see this all the time, right? And so it's why I argue for intrinsic value, <laughs> right? Because, yeah, because uh, I, uh, and, uh, and if it's instrumental, then it's aesthetic, yeah. right? I, I um. I don't know what to make of it. If you go to California and you walk around, you don't see a native plant, just about. I mean, you see some, right? See, they're mostly trees. Anyway. Yeah, so these principles come up just, I mean, these terms come up like apart from any of the environmental or climate context, right, when you're arguing in philosophy. And when we say something has instrumental value, we might say like your education has instrumental value. Why? Because the value of it is um, necessary or important to achieve some other thing that we value. So maybe you might think your education has instrumental value insofar as it makes you uh, a better citizen to be able to vote or that you know, getting an education at Princeton is gonna line you up for a, a job. So the job or being the good citizen would be the value up that you are holding upon which the value of the education is based, right? Does it achieve this sort of thing? So when something is instrumental, it's helping, right? Its value is placed in the other kinds of things that you value. Whether if something has instrumental or rather intrinsic value or some sort of inherent value, its value is not being evaluated based on its relationship to any other values. It's valuable in and of itself. So you might think that your education is intrinsically valuable, right? If you think that like education itself, <laughs> right, is something that is important apart from whether or not you're gonna get a good job 
or, or whether you're going to be a good citizen or something like that. So. Yeah, so for example, if a certain species was uh, like necessary for ecosystem health, if you were to argue that its value was for that reason, right, it's an instrument. It, it's the reason why you would value it is because it gets you some other thing that you value. The arguments are usually it preserves ecosystem function. It, it uh, is responsible for some either current or future economically valuable product, like a medicine, right? Um, or, or it makes people happy, all right? Yeah, it so can make right. people yeah. happy. But if you say it has intrinsic value, it's like saying human life is inherently valuable, all right? And like, you Just know, like that. right, exactly. If you, if you were to relate to persons, right? So if you're going and ordering a coffee, right? To some extent, the person who's taking your coffee order is instrumentally valuable insofar as like you need them to do the transaction in order for you to get your coffee. But we might say it would be a problem if the only way in which you were valuing the barista was for their mere instrumental value. So if you ever read Kant, right, you're going to see a, a, you know, a philosopher. That would be a problem because you would only be valuing um, a subject, right, that has autonomy and things like that, uh, for its kind of purpose of serving almost like an object, right? And so uh, you would be doing some sort of moral wrong if you were merely to say, see the barista as something that has instrumental value for the kind of reasons that Professor Bacall was just saying. Traditional conservation is much closer to intrinsic, and the new conservation is instrumental. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. That's the distinction. Uh, we've got time, I think, for one more. So be the last <laughs> if you're ready. We probably could squeeze two in if you want to talk. So the problem with water rights <clears throat> is that if they belong to you, if a certain amount of water belongs to you, you don't, and you have more than you need, you don't have any incentive to reduce its use. You've got just what you need to water all your avocado trees the way you always did. You just keep doing that. If instead, even if you're allowed to trade the water to somebody else, then you have, then you have an incentive to reduce it. Okay, and so. Um, and so, and, and, and beyond that even, if they charge you for the water, then you really have an incentive to reduce it, all right? So that's the, it's, the, it's, it's that simple distinction, okay? Is which policies give you the most incentive to be efficient in your water use? Even in places where they are short of water, like this um, San Joaquin Valley, Southern California, because the historical water rights give so much water to some landowners, they grow the water thirstiest crops they can find just to use it all up. Some of those places historically have had even paradoxically worse use it or lose it rules. So you, you have to use your water allowance or they'll take them away, even if you don't need it. And so they grow the most water thirsty crops in a water limited area just to keep their water rights. See? There's a good uh, documentary on like water wars if you're looking in California that kind of talks about that. So for my section, you should be able to distinguish between the two different types of arguments I talked about that you could use to morally justify um, advancing certain kinds of divestment practices and should know uh, sort of what is the, the different approaches that they're taking, where they diverge, and also to the extent to which, like, who are those arguments addressed to? 
so like spoiler alert, most of the time they're addressed to institutions, right, rather than individuals. So there was, we talked about the distinction between negative and positive arguments. So to be able to explain to me, you know, what a negative and positive argument entails, and usually when the divestment arguments take those different approaches, it's that they're arguing for a particular, uh, you know, value that's at play there. So if you're making an argument that you ought to divest because you ought to avoid harm, what kind of argument is that versus, right, one that's going to be um, centering on a different kind of reason to justify why divestment's going to be in place. So know the, like, kind of general overview that I gave of the different kinds of reasons you could go for arguing for divestment. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty booked. You can email me, though. I held a review, an open review session today, um, and it was recorded. And I'm going to have it up on my Canvas, but maybe I can send it to Robbie to put up on, on the 200C Canvas. But if you have a specific question, you could email me as well. But I, I won't be having any more sitting office hours besides what I gave today for the exam. But yeah, um, best thing to do is just email us. I don't. Um, they're uh, like um, fifty percent of it is four. I'd say forty. Uh, I think less, because because you got to answer four from me, two from Simona. What four? Two from Sarah. Yeah, I, I you know I think the number is going to be closer to fifteen or less. But they're differently valued, so they're going to probably be different lengths. So it's, you know, they're not all the same. I've got, you have to answer two 15s from me and two 10s. Okay. For me, it's two 10s and 10s. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's some like little teeny ones, right? But it's going to be like the midterm plus 50%, right? It's a midterm and a half is what it is, right? So, right, so that there is, in fact, a second midterm for the second half of the course. And then there's a 50 point, so it's like 100 points, and there's like a 50 point, um, yeah, from, from everything. Y yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, unless... No. <laughs> God, no. Yeah. No, no. It's going to look a lot like the midterm. It's going to look like a the longer. midterm. Plus 50%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't have any questions where you wouldn't find the key concepts and terms uh, on the slides. So that's just to say the slides are your guidance. And then what I would do is look at those and then look back at the readings to see if you could be able to beef up your arguments um, about drawing the distinctions that are there on the slides. I mean, a killer exam picking strategy is always, if they're like critical take home points, be able to address them and then look in the readings for at least one example that you can add from the readings. Yeah. And then you look like you read everything. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what people do. Yes. I mean, you know, <laughs> Right. Yeah, the readings should help support the key points that I was highlighting. So I'm not going to pull something obscure from the readings that I didn't talk about. Yeah, I mean, I, I strategically lectured to the content of the course. So I, I, the reason why I chose the things that I chose was because it was a way to help think philosophically through some of the other kind of content that was that was going on. So, like I said, if, if you're able to pull from Professor Bacala's slides as evidence or it, uh, working examples that demonstrate to me that you understand the concepts, then that would be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's because. Um, because 
you need to stop emitting CO2 or it keeps rising in the atmosphere. It's not like methane, right? You can have the emissions of methane and the concentration of methane in the atmosphere falls in half. If you drop the emissions of CO2 in half, it still rises to infinity, but just half as fast. So you, because it's so long lived in the atmosphere, you actually have to stop it. The reason that, in my view, the, what I argued is that the reason that two degrees came in, um, in the, at the time of Paris was because the alternatives, the technology to make net zero happen, finally became cost competitive. And the arguments that you'll see in the press are that the scientists discovered that we were about ready to step over a cliff. It was the last safe number. Now one and a half degrees is the last safe number. In my view, that's not true. All right, where there is no tipping point that's so nearby that we can point to that we're gonna step over at 1.6 or something. All right, most of the tipping points are quite a ways away. Now it could be one close by, we just don't know about it, right? But what I do know is that when this happened, we went from getting started to getting finished, that's the dominant argument. And then the question is, why 2050? It's because the lifetime of a power plant is 30 years long. And if you mothball things before they wear out, it costs you a fortune. If you let them amortize away and replace them when they need to be replaced anyway, it's cost competitive, all right? Yeah, you're right, of course. I mean, that's exactly right. But the natural sinks, remember, are, um, um, so, so the natural sinks are operating, remember the, I mean, we, we talked about that a lot, right? So if we get to net, and nobody understands this, right, who's negotiating, thank God. But, but uh, if we stop emissions in 2050 and keep it stopped, then what'll happen is over the course of the next 150 years, the atmospheric CO2 concentration will drop. All right. If people understood that fully, they might well argue to drop emissions to the size of the natural sinks. Okay, but, but I can show you experts. You go to Congress, and I bet you there's not a single member of the House of Representatives or Senate who knows that. I bet none. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe there's one. <laughs> that gets me out, you see. <laughs> okay, so he, so you said, I said there was one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. All right, people. Good luck this week, and then have a great holiday. Stay healthy. Stay healthy.